Welcome into another episode of Locked On Phillies. And the Phillies 2024 season is on the line. They face elimination tonight. How can they avoid it and force a game five? We'll talk about it in today's episode. You are Locked On Phillies, your daily Philadelphia Phillies podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, this is Locked On Phillies. I'm your host, Connor Thomas. We come to you as part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Uh, You may know me from some of my other work in the sports talk space here in Philadelphia. I've been on the radio for five years now, over at 97.5, the fanatic here in Philly, talking in sports. Uh, This is my third year as a credentialed Philadelphia Phillies media member and my third season as the host of Locked On Phillies. Please make sure you're rating, reviewing, subscribing to the YouTube, all that great stuff that helps us out here on Locked On Phillies. And today's episode is brought to you by Booking.com, Booking.Yeah. The right stay can make you a fan of any city, even your baseball rivals. Book today on Booking. Booking.com, the official accommodation partner of Major League Baseball. Get the Booking.com app today. Um, sorry if I'm not my regular cheery self today, folks, but the situation is dire. The Philadelphia Phillies are facing elimination. They came up short, as short as you can be, in game three of this series. And now everything's on the line, on the road, against the Red Hot Mets team, your division rival up in Queens, and you've got your backs against the wall. Uh, we're going to talk about what happened in Game 3 to lead to this, uh, what they can do in Game 4 to create a Game 5, and just the feeling of having everything on the line as a baseball team and as a, whew, man, as a franchise maybe even. I don't think I'm overstating that uh, when we look at what could be at stake with this Philadelphia Philly season and it potentially ending in this manner tonight, or what could be gained by – winning and giving yourself an opportunity in game five. We'll get into all of it. But let's talk about last night's game because um, I know there's people out there saying, do we have to? Yeah, we've got it. It was miserable. It was absolutely miserable. First, I owe you mea culpa. I I can't believe yesterday's episode, now that I look back, right, uh, was titled, uh, do the Philadelphia Phillies have a major pitching mismatch or whatever, major pitching advantage, or however I titled it, basically saying, well, Aaron Nola's career postseason record is unbelievable compared to Sean Manaya's. Sean Manaya also hasn't had success against a lot of the Phillies hitters. So pitching advantage for the Phillies easily, right? Um, not exactly. Sean Manaya went seven innings of three hit ball. He did end up having a run allowed according to his stat sheet, but that came as something after he was out of the game, an inherited runner allowed by a bullpen pitcher. He was as dominant as dominant gets. As good as Zach Wheeler was in game one of this series, Sean Manaya was in game three of this series. And that's insane because Sean Manaya is not Zach Wheeler, and the Phillies' offense is not the Mets' offense. And yet, Sean Manaya, the weird cross-firing lefty, goes out there, and pitches the game of his darn life for the New York Mets. Uh, and like that's where this story really, really starts for game three. I know Aaron Nola didn't have his best day. He goes five innings. He gives up four earned. One of those was a run allowed by a reliever that was an inherited runner uh, as well, similar to the Manaya situation. So really he gave up three, and he gave up a couple bombs, and I get it, right? But – Aaron Nola didn't really lose you that game last night. And the bullpen didn't really lose you that game last night. I know the final score was 7-2, to two, so you say, well, if Nola gave up four, then the bullpen gave up three more, and that would be absolutely accurate. Your math is correct there. And the bullpen is something, like, we're going to talk about that when we, when we look at, like, everything on the line and what's happened in the series so far, and that'll be more of a reflective conversation. But they have not been good, and they weren't good again last night. Um, and you might say, wow, the offense, the offense just goes dead silent in a game three up in New York where you need them so badly. And that's as close as you can get besides hitting what I think the actual reason is, uh, the offense is certainly, certainly to blame for game three up there at city field. Like they need to be so much better in a spot against Sean Mania, a guy they can handle. But sometimes, and it pains me to do this, but sometimes you see a pitcher that has not had success against certain players or certain teams or in certain spots, and the lights are bright, and they go out there and they dominate. 
And you kind of just have to tip your cap to Sean Mania and the New York Mets. They went out there and they won that game. Mania was unbelievable. I don't think that the Phillies even put together all that many like awful, awful at bats. They weren't great at bats, right? It's not like they were grinding out. Everybody took had like seven, eight pitch at bats and he got them out of there quick. But in the time he was in the game, he was really good. No, like he was getting quick outs. And some players on the Philadelphia Phillies, looking at you, Al Cone, uh, were not taking pitches the way that they probably should have been and having quick at bats. But there's another way to approach this too. Like, he threw 91 pitches, and I believe only 26 were balls. Uh, like, he was in the zone a lot, a lot of time. That would be, what, 65 uh, strikes of 91 pitches? That's a pretty darn aggressive day from Sean Manaya. And if he's going to throw strikes, he's going to have you down 0-1. You don't want to go down 0-2. Uh, you're going to start being more aggressive and then gets to chase out of the zone. That's not a bad approach at the plate. That's what Zach Wheeler does to people. That's what Tariq Skubal does to people. That's what Chris Sale does to people. That's what the great pitchers in the game do to people. They attack early. They have good enough stuff to get away with it. When you have them down 0-2, you make a nasty out pitch. You hope they swing. And if they don't, you do it again until they're out. And Sean Mania executed that to perfection yesterday. Aaron Nola didn't pitch terribly, but his misses were misses middle-middle or middle-up. And he was getting barreled. Pete Alonzo goes yard. That sucks. Jesse Winker hits an absolute tank. That sucks. But that's because when Nola missed, he was missing down the middle. When Mania missed, it was out of the zone and or down. And when he was on, he was painting corners. And he just, like, if I was a Mets fan, I would, like, Sean and I would never buy another beer in that city again no matter what happens the rest of the series because of that effort. So I don't know. At some point, you do have to get away from the locked-in narrative, not locked-on narrative, locked-in narrative of like, well, the Phillies' approach isn't good at the plate, and they always try and hit home runs. And sometimes just realize when you had a guy that just beat you. And last night, Sean Mania just beat the Phillies. But that can be a little bit of a cop-out too. Oh, he was just better. Well, that's why off baseball. You're going to face good pitching, so you got to figure some things out. So I brought it up. Like the approaches at the plate, some of them really rough. Alec Boehm had some rough approaches. Yohan Rojas swung early in a bat that he probably shouldn't have and gone, went after a pitch that he probably shouldn't have, could have worked the count a little bit more. He didn't have production from basically anybody. I mean, Kyle Schorber worked a walk and – Trey Turner worked a walk, and then Bryce Harper comes up and puts together an absolute terrible at bat uh, in the game. Like, And I'm not mad at Bryce Harper for being aggressive there. there here's the thing you got to remember. Bryce Harper's the guy that's supposed to be aggressive. He's the guy that Kyle Schwarber and Trey Turner are walking to get on for. As good as Castellanos was in game two, they're not walking to get on base for Castellanos. They're walking to get on base for Bryce Harper to go yard to make that game more interesting. But – Unfortunately, Manaya just made three really good pitches. It's kind of, it is what it is at that point. Um, so I guess, does the approach need to change? Sure. Yeah, it definitely does. You need to be more selective. Uh, you need to tighten up the zone a little bit. But Manaya was a weird case where it's almost like, yeah, the same narrative exists, but last night that wasn't the main reason. It was just him being better than your hitters, which I guess you could say is a big enough problem in and of itself. He had a 10 6 6 career postseason in the ERA. You couldn't find any way with him around the zone so much to scrape across more than two runs, and those two runs came late after the game was already basically over. Um, I, I don't know what you say to that at this point. And I'm tired of having games where I sit here dumbfounded in front of this laptop the next day and try and explain to you how the Phillies lost that big of a baseball game in that type of fashion. But, well, we at least have to do it this one more time. And they're facing elimination tonight, and we'll see if they could fight it off. But if they put the effort out there that they did last night, it's not going to go all that well for them. Uh, defensively, I think the Philadelphia Phillies were fine. Base running, I think the Philadelphia Phillies were fine. Alec Bohm seemed to make a base running mistake trying to stretch something, a single into a double early on in the game. I, there was the ball off the wall in the right uh, center field gap, and Tyrone Taylor made an unbelievable play and threw him out. That's not even on Alec Bohm. There was just some stuff where it was like the ball is not bouncing their way. Nick Castellanos with runners on first and second and one out. hits a line drive to the second baseman. It turns into a double play. There's nothing you can do there. You barrel the baseball. There was this element of unluckiness 
matched with this guy throwing a gem, matched with some bad approach, matched with Aaron Nola hitting too many barrels. It was just a nightmare of a game for the Philadelphia Phillies. Uh, and it's okay to say that. It doesn't always have to be, see, I told you so. It's the same old thing. Because it's not always the same old thing. The playoff baseball is always weird and always different, and it's rarely the same narrative or the same way you lose, especially when you have as good of a team as the Philadelphia Phillies have. And last night it was just one of those games. And it was a bad day to have one of those games because now you're facing elimination. And there are a lot of things that they, there are questions about. Who do you start? What does the manager do with the pen? Is Ranger Suarez, like, is his arm even alive? Uh, how crazy does Rob Thompson manage this game early? And how nervous are the players? Well, that's a lot of stuff that we're going to try and break down. But the ultimate thing is you you got to count on the man in the arena. And it's hard for me to say sitting here. But we'll break down the X's and O's and everything coming up next. And we are also going to get into the mentality of it uh, as we continue today's episode of Locked on Phillies. I want to talk to you about FanDuel first because the NFL season's rolling. Uh, baseball postseason here. Basketball season starting in a couple weeks. Hockey season started last night. The NHL season, they had puck drop for the first time last night. So you've got a bunch of stuff you can bet on. Don't forget about even college football. There's a lot of different options on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. And you might figure stuff out before the game. Or you might see a game like last night with the Phils and say, hmm, I'm kind of getting a hunch in the middle of the game of something that's going on. I want to make a live bet. Well, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Again, you'll get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. So what are you waiting for? You got money on the line. You can win it. You can go ahead and claim that $200 by making your first $5 bet. It's a no-brainer. You want to make money on the games, especially if they're going to go not in your favor like last night did. So go ahead and check out FanDuel.com. I also want to tell you about game time. Listen, it's 337. If you're in the New York area and you want to buy tickets to tonight's NLDS Game 4, hopefully you're a Phillies fan looking for your team to fight off elimination. Uh, or I hate to say it, but for the sake of the advertiser, if you're a Mets fan, you want to get down there and you want to see if your team could potentially uh, clinch the series. I hope they don't, uh, but go through game time. They're amazing. And you know what else is going to happen? If the Phillies win tonight, nobody's got tickets for game five yet. No one's sure that it's going to happen. So go to game time. It's the quickest, fastest, easiest way to do stuff. Comedy, concerts, theater, all kinds of sports, including the baseball playoffs. You can get tickets at game time. They got the all-in pricing that they show you up front, so the fees don't like surprise you at the end. You'll get to see them from the jump, plus seat view, so you'll get a panoramic view from your seat in the app before you buy. You know exactly what it's going to look like when you arrive to your event. They've got the lowest price guarantee, the game time guarantee, as they call it, which means if you find a seat in the same row and section for less, game time will credit you 110% of the difference. <coughs> Excuse me. And your ticket is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry. They're happy to help you out with any issues that arise. Game time is the best. So while you still have the chance and the Phillies are still alive, go ahead and take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use code locked on MLB, and you'll get $20 off your first purchase. In terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code locked on MLB for $20 off. Download game time today. What time is it? It's game time. All right, let's jump into this conversation about the last game of the season that matters right now for the Philadelphia Phillies, game four. And you're not in an ideal spot. You're just flat out not. Ranger Suarez is going to the mound. That's what they're doing. They're not throwing Zach Wheeler on short rest or anything like that. Uh, they're not going bullpen game technically. Now it may turn into a bullpen game if Ranger Suarez can't figure it out. But you are going with Ranger Suarez on the mound. And if you had been in a coma since June, you would wake up and say, oh, well, this is no problem. Ranger Suarez is the best pitcher in baseball. He's been better than Wheeler. Yeah, well, a lot's changed in the second half of the season. Ranger Suarez has not had the velocity. He's not had the feel. He's had some injured list stints. He's had some 
issues going on with his back and his arm and everything. And he has never thrown this many innings in his career. And the fatigue has set in. And that's why Christopher Sanchez threw game two and Aaron Nola threw game three. And now all of a sudden, Ranger Suarez, who looked like he could have been, if you had looked in the first two, three months of the season, the game one starter for Philadelphia is now the game four starter for Philadelphia. And part of it is questions about how healthy he is. And that's what worries you. Because if it was a go out there and, hey, be that guy you were in April and May and June, well, that's one thing. If it's a, our guy's hurt and he's a last resort, and we've got to use them in game four and then go to the bullpen as soon as possible type of situation, well, then your expectations are lower. And I don't know which one it is. I'm not saying it's one or the other. But it does seem to me that the fear of dead arm is what's going to be the biggest worry about Ranger Suarez today. Not finding his stuff, not having a feel for it, not being able to generate the velocity to create movement. That would be the worry for Ranger Suarez. But that's the worry. There's two sides to every coin. There's a great quote that I love from Max Homa. He's a professional golfer. If you know the golf game, you know Max Homa. He's a really, really good one of the top golfers in the world. And the quote is, when I catch myself thinking of what could go wrong, I allow myself to dream of what could go right. It's a great quote. I love every bit of it. And right now, I think there's a lot of people in Philadelphia that are catching themselves thinking about what could go wrong. Well, Ranger, his arm's dead. You're facing elimination. You're up there. You're on the road. We don't know if we really trust us. All the momentum's there away. Uh, this offense isn't creating anything. we got all these issues. Think about what could go right for a second. Let yourself dream of it. I'm not saying it's the most realistic thing. I'm not saying it's even the likely thing. I'm just saying that it is a possibility, right? Ranger Suarez is a damn good pitcher still. It's not that he forgot how to pitch. It's not that he stinks. He might just be at the end of his rope for the year. But when you come back next year, you expect him to be a good pitcher, right? And the year after that, that guy's still in there. So can he summon up enough in game four of the NLDS against the New York Mets to go? And they're not asking him to do what Wheeler did in game one and give you seven shutout innings of what one hit ball. They're asking him to go to the mound and try and get through four innings. Try and maybe get through five innings. You don't have to do anything spectacular. You just have to go out there and try and get through four or five scoreless or one run inning uh, ball and get to a point where the bullpen, which, my goodness, the bullpen, uh, can try and take this thing home. But that doesn't sound too crazy, does it? And on the other hand, Jose Quintana is who you're going to face on the mound. I mean, Jose Quintana in the regular season had a 3.75 ERA. That's not insane. He had 135 strikeouts. He threw um, 170 in a third innings pitched. So you're looking at a situation where he did not have nearly as many strikeouts as he had innings pitched. You've got another lefty on the mound in Quintana, so you got to think about that with the lineup, but he's not the strikeout risk that Sean Manaya is. I brought that up yesterday and how that could be trouble for the Phillies, as it always is when I see more strikeouts than innings pitched. But, okay, you could get this guy still. And this offense is still highly powered. And remember what you were thinking in, like, sixth inning of game two, where it's like, oh, this offense is never going to hit. And then they go and score seven runs from that point going forward. So it's not ideal to live on a hope and a prayer, but it's all we got right now. So you can either choose to do that or you can choose to believe that all the bad things in the world are going to happen to this Phillies team. And uh, logically, you have a point when you're worried about Ranger Suarez. I don't know if he has an arm left, and if he doesn't, the Phillies are in trouble. The bullpen, I don't know how they've been this bad. They were amazing in the regular season, and they've been historically bad through three games of their postseason so far. Maybe they snap out of it. Uh, I actually do have a thought on that real quick with the bullpen. If they don't, the season might as well be over, because if you advance to the NLCS with this bullpen still giving up a run like basically every inning, you're going to get smoked by anybody else in the postseason too. Not that like the Mets aren't already beating you, but I'm just saying like the bullpen needs to pull their heads out of their rears in general, if it's even worth it to move on. So they're going to have to have a game tonight. They're going to have to show up and show up. You need some big time innings out of guys. Uh, The offense is going to need to come alive and they're not going to do it by hitting home runs. They may, but like they're going to do it by first putting together good approaches to get uh, at the plate 
and better swings on baseballs and still attacking strikes. You can't take that out of him ever, but you're going to have to look at Quintana and say, okay, he's not a guy that's going to strike out a bunch of guys. So we can be more patient. He's not going to blow stuff by us. So you can get up there and say, all right, time to go to work on a guy that in the postseason, by the way, he's been good this year in one start in six innings. He had a 0.83 whip and a zero ERA. Uh, yeah, pretty darn good so far by Jose Quintana. So I, I don't know. It's not the most ideal spot, but does that mean he's due for one of those blow up starts? I guess one on one off is kind of not really being due, but these are the rationalizations that you have to make as a fan. And they're the rationalizations that Rob Thompson has to make as a manager. And who do you put into the lineup? Do you bring back Bryson Stott, who sat yesterday against the lefty and hit him against the lefty today? Do you bring back Brandon Marsh, who sat against the lefty yesterday for Austin Hayes and put him in the lineup today? Or does Edmundo Sosa go back out there in the infield and Hayes in the outfield and you go with those guys? Does Weston Wilson get swings? Like, there's a lot of tough decisions and when and how you go to your bullpen matters. I would start Stott. I would start Marsh. And I would go to your bullpen as early as the third inning if you have to because of what I'm going to talk to you coming up next. Everything in this game four, everything is on the line for the Philadelphia Phillies. It's a scary thought, but one we need to come to terms with uh, as we continue today's episode. Let's talk about our title sponsor, Booking.com, because sometimes everything's on the line when you go on vacation. Sometimes you're in a situation where you say, man, I need to make sure that I'm staying at a place that is family friendly or that has a restaurant with it or that it is near nightlife or maybe near a baseball stadium. Booking.com can help you with that. They can give you all the information you need and help you set up your best stay possible. And you can explore those U.S. cities you always secretly want to learn more about other baseball cities. Maybe even your baseball rivals city. So shh, I won't tell anybody. But you got to go to booking.com and you got to check out the great deals that they have and the great information that they have on how you can book your next big vacation, even if it's to New York or Atlanta or Washington or Miami. So go ahead and download the app. You can download the app, the booking.com app. You can download or you can check it out on the website, booking.com. You know, come on, booking. Yeah, that's the greatest slogan that we do right now uh, for any of our advertising. Like, I love the booking.com. Uh, slogan. Uh, but what I love even more is the way that they help you compare prices and look up stuff about your uh, potential destinations and booking.com has everything you need. So booking.com, booking. Yeah, it's the number one way to go. If you're going for a baseball trip, if you're going for a trip in general, and even if you're going to your rival team city. So go ahead and again, check them out on the app or on their website, booking.com. All right, folks. Uh, I've said it a couple times this episode, but I don't know any other ways to say it. Everything's on the line. You have everything on the line tonight. There are going to be some players that play tonight if the Philadelphia Phillies do not win this baseball game for the last time in a Phillies uniform. And I will give you a taste of who they could be because one of them could play left field. One of them probably does play left field in a platoon role. You could be changing things entirely in that corner of the outfield. Your center fielder may not be back. Can they still have a guy out there that doesn't totally hit the way that they want to? Your right fielder, they tried to chop him last year. I'm saying shop with an S, not chop with a C. Uh, shop him last year. They were looking, and they may try and move Nick Castellanos again. You have some aging stars. Alec Bohm got benched one game into a postseason run. Uh, I think he'll still be here, but like – uh, there's some bullpen arms. Carlos Estevez, do you resign him? Jeff Hoffman, do you resign him? This is a conversation for later on when we get to the offseason, hopefully in November, right? Because this ain't over. Uh, but these are the things at stake. Like these are the emotions these guys are feeling. Hey, is this the last time I put this uniform on? Hey, is this the last stand here in Philadelphia? Is this the close of a championship contention window? Absolutely not. Win or lose tonight. Uh, and we're not really trying to come to terms with like, ah, oh, what is this team going to do in the offseason yet? Like, that's not what I'm saying. My point is we don't often think about in the moment more than this season ending, but it's going to be 
the ending of part of an era for the Philadelphia Phillies if they do not win tonight's ball game. And that's a lot on the minds of these players and on the mind of this manager and on the minds of fans like you out there listening. Yeah, thank you so much for checking us out on Locked on Phillies. We appreciate you uh, very much. I hope this is not the last episode I do previewing in game all year. There's a very good chance that I put the victory shirt on for the last time. There's also a chance that I'm going to be wearing it tomorrow and talking to you about a game five with Zach Wheeler on the mound. By the way, that's something else that's on the line tonight. If you win, you're coming back to Citizens Bank Park and Zach Wheeler in a game five elimination game with the Mets as nervous as you, with their season on the line too, they're stepping into the cage fight and they could be killed that game. Yeah, they don't want that to happen. So they're going to try and take care of business. But heck, the Phillies should fight like hell to make sure that they get that opportunity for their ace that they blew a game for in game one, specifically the bullpen. They need to sack up and have themselves a game. Like all of this stuff is going through their mind and all of this emotion is racing through their mind. And the Phillies facing elimination. Well, it hasn't exactly gone their way recently. Not with this team. They don't, they didn't face elimination very often in the last couple of times that they were in the postseason. They faced elimination one time in 2022. It was the final game of the World Series that they lost. They faced elimination one time in 2023. It was game seven of the NLCS, and they lost. And tonight they face elimination against the New York Mets in game four of the NLDS. And so far, this team, when they've been backed up to the brink, they haven't gotten a ton. It's a tough thing. And I'm not trying to scare you, but I'm just saying, like, that's why closeout games are so tough, but that's why also fighting off elimination is so tough. And to do it in two straight games, it's it's going to be a tough road. And remember, this is just series one, but there's a lot of stuff on the line. The approach that the Philadelphia Phillies have used all season, the aggressive approach at the plate, that's something that I believe is the character of this team, the makeup of this team, the calling card of this team, and of this manager, and of this hitting coach, and of this organization. That's how this team was built, and that was this theory that they decided to devise, or we're going to get guys who can hit the ball out of the yard because our ballpark's so small. And we're going to build a team with great sluggers. And that's what they did. And it's great in the regular season. And it can be great in the postseason. And it has been great in the postseason before. But it's never quite gotten you to that point yet. And if you regress, well, another year of regression might mean a change of that philosophy. Uh, the starting rotation will be largely the same, which is good news. But the bullpen, how can you ever believe in a bullpen again? If this bullpen doesn't get it done today in relief of Ranger Suarez, if indeed Ranger Suarez gets you a good enough start that the bullpen matters. Like this was as good of a bullpen as any team had in baseball. <coughs> Maybe the Brewers had a better one. And that's the team, ironically, that the Mets knocked off before seeing the Philadelphia Phillies. And maybe it's just the Mets and they have some weird magic about them. But I'm I don't know how I'm ever going to be able to look at a bullpen again if they don't pick this up and say, well, yeah, they're amazing in the regular season because I'm always going to think about this one. It's just going to be another scar that we're going to have to wear for the rest of our lives as Philadelphia sports fans. Or there's an alternative. There's a complete alternative. This could be your chance to go out and rewrite everything. The fan base right now, I talked to a lot of you this morning on 97.5 The Fanatic. I read a lot of texts from you. I got a lot of tweets from you. I know where this fan base is at. We are in a bad place mentally. People are mad at each other. They're mad at the team. They want this guy fired. They want this guy traded. They want this player to never show his face in town again. And all of that goes away if you win tonight. And all the momentum in the world is on your side for game five on Friday if you do get there. So, I don't know. Are you playing two game fives? Does it feel like the Mets will be gone if you win this one? Is splitting at City Field enough? Absolutely. You can come back and you can win that game. So uh, how bad do you want it? How bad do you want, if you're Bryce Harper, this era of baseball, this team that you essentially built yourself by recruiting players and them wanting to come play with you, how bad do you want these guys to get a ring? Uh, I mean, as Ranger Suarez, how bad do you want to go out there and show that you don't have dead arm and you can be a true postseason pitcher? And how pissed off are you that Christopher Sanchez got his opportunity not that you're mad about your teammate, but deep down inside, he better be angry. He's like, man, that guy gets that chance, and my body quit on me, and I didn't put together a good enough end of the season. Well, this is my chance now. They only gave me three innings last year against the Braves. I want six now. I want to go out there and absolutely shove. 
I want to show them that I'm good enough. If you're the bullpen and you've been all stars like Matt Strom and Jeff Hoffman this year, or Carlos Estevez, you were acquired, or Tanner Banks, you were acquired, or Ryan Kirkring, your young player trying to make your way, or Jose Alvarado, you've had a rough year. Go out there and prove that you guys are the best bullpen in baseball. And you've scored the fifth most runs in all of baseball as an offense. If you're Schwarber, Castellanos, uh, Harper, uh, uh, like Romuto, Bohm, Stott, Marsh, somebody, go out there and prove that you're as good of a baseball team as we thought you were through 95 wins and 162 games in the regular season. Because if you lose tonight, none of that matters. And if you win, everything's back on the table. It all comes down to this. Stakes have never been higher, not just for this year, but for years going forward. And that's what you got in just a little bit of time at City Field tonight. That's all for today's episode of Locked on Phillies. Thank you so much for checking us out. Win or lose, we're going to have an episode tomorrow. I hope it's a win. I hope the victory shirt's on. I hope I'm talking to you about another baseball game. Um, but, yeah, we don't know. We'll find out tonight. And we can only hold on for dear life and react to it tomorrow. I'll talk to you tomorrow on the next episode of Locked on Phillies.